Thank you uh, so much, everyone, uh, for joining us. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, you all, all not, uh, not everybody in the audience, but uh, the moderators as well, the participants to the Focus Ultrasound Foundation's GBM Symposium uh, and Workshop. Um, and uh, welcome to the first panel of the day. My name is Neil Lipsman. I'm from the University of Toronto. Uh, I'd like to thank, first of all, the Focus Ultrasound Foundation uh, and the steering committee who helped make this symposium and webinar possible for all their efforts, time, and energy uh, in organizing and all the participants and all of you out there for listening. Uh, so the topic of this first panel of the day is targeted delivery across the blood-brain barrier, overview of current clinical trials. Uh, we're privileged to have assembled a real all-star session uh, this morning with some of the luminaries and pioneers in the field working in this area uh, over the last several years. Um, I hope everyone has had a chance to, to at least review some of the talks in the last several days available online. Uh, and we're looking forward to the discussion over the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, this is meant to be a very interactive session. So if you have any questions out there, please don't hesitate to put them in the Q&A and uh, we'll certainly try to get to as many of those questions as possible. Uh, so with that, I'd just like to introduce uh, everyone uh, who is on this panel. Uh, Dr. Graham Woodworth is a professor and chair of Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Alexandra Gobi is a professor of neurosurgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard University. Dr. Adam Sonneband is an assistant professor of neurosurgery at Northwestern University in Chicago. Also at Northwestern is Dr. Roger Stoop, who's the chief of neuro-oncology and the Department of Neurology, and the Paul Busey professor of neurological surgery. Uh, Dr. Kuo Chen Wei uh, is not on the call at the moment, but he may join. Uh, he is the assistant professor of neurosurgery. He's joining us from Taiwan at the Changgang Memorial Hospital. Uh, Dr. Manmi Dalawalia is an oncologist and professor at the Department of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. And last but not least is Dr. Jim Woo Chang, who's professor of neurosurgery at Yunside University in South Korea and is currently the president of the World Society for Stereotactic and Functional Neurosurgery. So as we discussed, really a uh, uh, the, the luminaries and pioneers in the GBM and focus ultrasound field. So one of the first things that I wanted to ask, and this is a question really uh, to begin the discussion uh, and is really to everybody here. And this is to do with the state of clinical trials currently in the field. Many of these trials currently are in their earliest days. They're phase one trials with safety uh, of focus ultrasound being a primary outcome. So my question, uh, and perhaps Graham, I'll direct it to you first, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask everybody to, to weigh in as well, is how, how is safety assessed? How are you assessing safety of these trials? How are you monitoring safety during focused ultrasound procedures? And, and, and in general, what are your concerns and how can we work to mitigate this uh, moving forward? So maybe Graham, we'll start with you uh, and then uh, we'll open it up to everybody else. Sure. Thanks, Nir. And hopefully you can hear me okay. Just want to make yeah. sure. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. And it's great to join this uh, really exemplary group of scientists and clinicians who are working on this. I think it's a, it's a great time in the field and there's a lot of work that we can do together. So our, our work, as you know, um, sort of launches off of the thermal ablation work that, that has been done with the Insight Tech system and the safety and monitoring that's enabled through that system, specifically uh, having the patient awake during the procedure and monitoring the patient's neurological function, having the patient in the MRI scanner and monitoring their uh, imaging as well as their thermal treatment through MR thermometry. And so, you know, analogous to that, in, in the BVB treatments that we've been engaged in so far, we do try to keep the patients as, as um, non-sedated as possible, and we do monitor their neurological function during the treatment. So that's, that's one aspect of safety that I, I do think is important. Um, some I know have, have, have sort of leaned toward um, having the patient a little bit sleepier during these treatments, especially those that are frame-based. Uh, our patients have been tolerating it quite well with minimal sedation. So neurological function, real-time neurological function assessment has been valuable. We haven't seen any changes during these treatments, but we do monitor that very closely. So that's first and foremost our primary safety measure. Um, we also, as you know, are, have the patient in the MRI bore. Some folks uh, sites take the patient out of the bore and do the treatments outside just from a claustrophobia perspective. It's a lot of patients do like that better. We do keep the patients in the MRI bore and monitor their imaging during the treatment and specifically the T2 star imaging, which can be um, visualized real time now during the, the 
actual 90 second interval of the focus ultrasound treatment. And then lastly, you know, the acoustic emissions monitoring, I think is probably the most powerful way to understand the mechanical effects that are happening. Again, analogous to the MR thermometry that we have with the essential tremor treatments, having the real time acoustic emissions monitoring, knowing how much energy is being deposited, where it's being deposited, if it's going over a certain design threshold, a known safety threshold. To me, I think that's the, where the biggest innovation is occurring currently. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, Dr. Sonnabend, um, uh, you're, uh, you're using a, a different system as, and as the different ways of using ultrasound to, to, to open the BBB is out there. Maybe you can weigh in as well. How, what kind of, what are the things you're, you're, that are you're concerned about a priori and how are you mitigating this during, during your procedure? Yeah, thanks Nir and, and nice uh, in part of this, uh, appreciate the perspective that, that Graham uh, brings. So I will say we have started this uh, program at Northwestern uh, at the point where basically the safety of the uh, skull implantable ultrasound was more or less established. We, we participated in phase one at the end of the tail using carboplatin. So I think we were at a very advantageous situation as the safety of the approach and blood brain barrier opening was, was really uh, already established with the device we're using. The, the, compared to the devices I think that you have experience with, the acoustic energy that we use is much less because it doesn't have to go through the skull. Uh, what safety has been uh, looked at in, in the context of the, at least uh, my trial, is really its combination with uh, paclitaxel, which is, as you know, a, a potent chemotherapy that has no neuropathy as one of its side effects. So there's obviously a concern that if there's neuropathy related to this peripheral use, maybe there might be brain related injury as a result of getting this into the brain, but it's not really the blood brain barrier opening that we were so concerned about per se. Uh, luckily the preclinical studies and the dose escalation that we're doing so far has shown that there is no uh, you know, grade and grade two CNS toxicity related to or that can be attributed to paclitaxel in the brain. Now, as far as the sonication procedures, as Graham is saying, we do our sonication procedures for therapeutic purposes with the patient without any sedation. Our sonication procedure takes approximately four minutes. Uh, we do not do MR guided uh, sonication procedures. We do get MRIs after sonication for confirmation of blood brain opening. And we haven't seen any hemorrhage in that context, but uh, the safety is established by monitoring the patient for the next six hours. Uh, before the patient can be discharged home. We have noticed some transient neurological deficits and symptoms related to the area of sonication. They usually go away within a few minutes. Great, oh, thanks, uh, thanks for that. Um, a question for uh, uh, Manmeet and Roger, uh, the, the oncologist uh, uh, in the group. I mean, Roger, your name is synonymous with the, the protocol currently used for GBM. Um, and I think, you know, it would be critical to get your views on, on, on an important question, which is you, with this technology, um, where do you feel and at what point do you feel the optimal time for something like focus ultrasound would be in the treatment algorithm for treating glioblastoma, upfront, maintenance, recurrence, et cetera. Where, what are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, I think it, not only for the ultrasound, the question is, when you do the research, what is the question we want to answer? When you go on a long, once we know it, what it does and what it works, ideally, I don't want to have a recurrence. So I want to move everything as early as possible uh, to really get control of the disease because we get the most mileage out of all our intervention up front. You know, initial surgery is better than uh, the surgery for the second recurrence uh, when it's growing back three, uh, within three months. So I think the same is true here. But of course, as we are in a new era, we um, really, what are we achieving? Is it uh, a small residual upfront? Do we want to just have the margin? Are we testing new devices where we don't know yet what to expect? you would do for this toxicity testing in the recurrent setting. But if we are going to be sitting here in two years time, hopefully, and everybody has some data and we say, okay, this is promising and encouraging enough that we want to go for an efficacy trial. Shall we go necessarily for another trial in second or third line, pivotal trial, 
or shall we move, uh, shall we move it up front? Uh, and here in the analogy, temozolomide in the recurrent setting didn't actually work and was not even approved initially. It was an accelerated approval only for uh, grade threes. Uh, and uh, the same was true for tumor treating fields that in recurrent setting did not show a signal that we were able to capture in the early set. So I think the question comes from there right now. And depending on what we learn over the years, it, uh, the answer may be a little bit different. Uh, so uh, I would add to that, uh, and I agree what uh, you know. Roger has said. Uh, you know, clearly uh, in our field, uh, in recurrent glioblastoma, we have not had a single agent or a single mortality which has really truly increased a single day survival for any of our patients. And this is a critical component for us to remember. But if you look at drug development, right, when the pharmaceutical companies go into drug development, they always like to go in the place where is the lowest hanging fruit. And typically, that's recurrence. That might be true for most tumors, but as Roger has very eloquently pointed out, glioblastoma probably is an exception to that rule. Uh, however, what I would say is, can we learn from the recurrent space? Absolutely. I think we can do some window of opportunity trials or proof of concept small pilot studies to understand what is happening to an agent, how is the focused ultrasound helping increase drug delivery? And those kind of pilot trials can still be done in the recurrent setting because there you may be able to test an agent as a, a lone single agent. We know in a front setting, obviously, you know, we still use temozolomide for uh, you know, our, all of our patients outside the context of a clinical trial where we sometimes in unmethylated patients will take an experimental agent and replace the temozolomide because we know uh, from the study that Dr. Shoup led that temozolomide only uh, confers a 24 day benefit there, which was statistically significant, but clinically not very meaningful. So I think uh, we can probably have a mixture, but based on uh, you know, our track record so far, I would like, just like to repeat, uh, when people look at drug development, I tell all the uh, pharmaceutical companies, our challenge is that we've not had any modality uh, result in any single day benefit in reference setting. I think I would use that setting more for proof of concept testing. And then based on what we are seeing, look at where uh, companies need to invest in upfront setting. The, one other thing to keep in mind is if you go for upfront setting, typically those trials are gonna be longer and typically though the end that we need to show a benefit is gonna be larger. So suddenly the uh, uh, amount of resources, any institution, any company or any uh, entity that is interested in drug development or furthering the care needs to confer that into account when they make decisions. So that's a great uh, that's a great segue, I think, to an important question. And maybe I'll ask uh, Alex uh, if you could weigh in on this. And this is, you know, a question about outcomes. And maybe it's something we can actually ask everybody. Um, how do we measure outcomes? What is a successful outcome uh, in these trials? Are we looking at PFS, OS? Are we looking at uh, something that is, you know, fits very neatly into the treatment algorithm? What do you see as a successful uh, outcome for a first trial in, in, in GBM? Uh, thank you. So I think uh, building on what Roger said, um, treating, we, we have the opportunity in our phase one trial to be treating patients in the upfront newly diagnosed setting, which I think is probably the, the best opportunity to show um, an improvement and also um, the best opportunity to minimize any treatment related complications as these patients have had far fewer interventions um, and their brain is, is uh, less impacted by multiple rounds of treatment um, and by the disease itself. Obviously these are our phase one um, patients. And so any measurements of outcome such as progression-free survival, overall survival are secondary endpoints. Um, and, but I think obviously we're all collecting these, we're all optimistic that we're gonna see some, some signal there of efficacy. And we do have some historical co controls um, because I, the, the benefit, again, another benefit of the upfront setting is that the patients are, are less, um, heterogeneous in terms of different treatments that they've been through. Um, so I think we can, we can probably identify patients um, who meet the inclusion criteria in terms of the extent of surgical resection, 
Karnofsky performance score, et cetera, who can serve as reasonable controls. Great, thank you. Uh, Jinwu, maybe uh, I can ask you as well. I mean, we, I know we, we, we have discussed in the past, you know, the challenges, but in terms of what you consider in your practice, what would you consider a successful outcome uh, for focused ultrasound uh, in glioblastoma? Oh yeah, uh, the I went underwent in the first clinical trial uh, with temozolomide in the two years ago, and at the time uh, we used in the uh, the first version of the, uh, the the system from Inside Tech. But at the time we could only offer the small amount of the the frame the volume. As you know, the uh, for our first clinical trial, we chose the patient with uh, the cross total removal <clears throat> after the uh, initial diagnosis. We didn't do any treatment for the recurrent tumors. But in our first clinical trial for the uh, <clears throat> glioblastoma, after the resection, we saw the, the some benefit of the temozolomide with the BB opening. However, as you mentioned, we don't know the uh, which type of the, the, the tumor, I mean, the, uh, or uh, we don't know which you know, the method of the treatment is the really best one. As you know, the, we recently underwent the, the, uh, the second clinical trial for the recurrent glioblastoma with the carboplatin, and we are now treating the patient after the recurrence of the tumors. But the most important thing is the, uh, obviously the uh, overall survival. But the, um, it depends on the, the patient condition as well as the expansion of the tumors of the, uh, the first operation and uh, recurrence. So there are many factors, but at this moment, you know, we don't know which type of the um, recurrence or which type of the, the tumors, for example, MGM positive or other uh, the genetic factors. So there are many uh, uh, unknown you know, the factors that can affect you know, the BB opening. But I think you know, at this moment, because we are now undergoing the phase one clinical trial, just wanna confirm the safety issues of the BB opening. But the more, more importantly, compared to my first clinical trial, for the second clinical trial, we just applied the, the more extensive BB opening. This method is quite unique. And uh, as you, you also had some experience, this why the BB opening ask more amount of the micro bubble and also more cautious BB offering, uh, not to make any the micro bleeding. So at this moment, I, I really don't know which factor is most important and the, which evaluation factor is very important in the, for the uh, uh, kind, of, kind of the uh, guideline of the, uh, the best you know, the candidate of the, this therapist, but I think, um, we need to search about you know, the, the, these factors. No, oh, thank you for that, uh, Professor Chang and, and 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 Graham. I think that you know um, it, it, it's a challenge, and I was wondering if you can sort of weigh in a bit because uh, what what seems to be happening uh, is there are advances in the technology which you've described, which are which are great uh, mm -hmm. improvements in the workflow. Uh, and at the same time, parallel advances happening on the therapeutic front. Uh, and the question then becomes, uh, you know, how, how, with all of these things happening at the same time, how are we able to balance this in, in order to, to really determine whether the device and, and the concept of opening the BBB is actually effective with all of these things happening at the same time? How do you, how do you feel we should be balancing things? And I think that's a great point. And while we currently use contrast enhanced MRI to tell us whether the blood brain barrier is open in certain treated regions versus not. One of the key issues I think for all of us to consider is whether blood brain barrier opening of one type or visualization strategy is equivalent to another. You know, does blood brain barrier opening over a certain amount of time, but with the same amount, you know, so if it takes a longer amount of time, so Adam mentioned it takes about four minutes with their current system to open the blood-brain barrier within the region that the system can target, is that equivalent, that time and duration of mechanical energy that's deposited within that field similar or different to 
the same degree of blood brain barrier opening as visualized by MRI. Again, I think that's maybe a relatively crude way to, to, to discern what's going on. But is that equivalent to what we're doing with the entice in Cytex system? I think that's a huge assumption that we should not be making. And I think once we get to the bottom of this and understand this a little bit in a deeper way, then we can ask questions about, well, is that form of blood brain barrier disruption or that degree of blood brain barrier disruption appropriate or optimized for small molecule delivery? Is another or the same equivalent or, or necessary for antibody mediated delivery? And perhaps more importantly, as we've seen with the preclinical studies, does a certain degree of blood brain barrier disruption, again, I think we need more than just contrast and MRI, enhanced MRI to answer this, but I, you know, do we uh, need something more or less for nanotherapeutic delivery, for example? Adam's work with the Abraxane, I think is gonna be very important related to that. So I, I think we need to, to be thinking about this device, these devices, what type of blood brain barrier disruption we're actually doing and not just calling it one thing. Because I think there's more to it than just new contrast enhancement within a given region. Roger, what do you, what do you think? Uh, I mean, as somebody who's worked in, you know, the medical uh, therapeutic side and also tumor treating field, what are your thoughts on that? No, I think it, uh, at some point we have to prioritize. We can't change all the variables. I think what Frank just said, I think we need to have uh, better endpoints. I think what we are doing uh, with Adam measuring actually the concentrations is uh, a very nice, almost perfect way, but of course uh, the least feasible one. Um, we don't know, not only you know how much of the opening, it may not be this need the same amount of opening depending what agent you use, how long the opening lasts. And we see some of the limitations there with the imaging. I think we just talked briefly uh, before we went live that uh, the whole timing of administration uh, plays a role. We should keep some of the parameters at some point uh, in a way stable. And I think that's like in drug development. You know, a, a drug comes out with a certain schedule usually we stuck with it. And when you see how we choose this initial schedule on a drug, um, you're somewhat surprised. There's not a very smart way. Um, but that's then the schedule that will stay. So I think the parameters that have been set for the different technologies, right now I think need to be stable um, or in a complete different kind of investigation, how we optimize the technology and play around with the parameters. And then you can optimize, but you need to do it stepwise. But I think now the field want to see some kind of efficacy um, rather than just another image uh, that looks beautiful uh, that the blood brain barrier is opening. So I think here we need to do that. Now, is to the inside check technology the same approach we have been taking with Adam to the um, uh, with the Cartera device, the implantable device, an option? Could you do that pre-op uh, and and bring the patient into uh, into surgery immediately after? You know, I think we're already suffering from logistics, but we have to overcome the logistics in early stage. It's not uh, logistics now. When something works, we'll figure it out afterwards on large scale. But I think that's uh, that would be a question that we can cross compare. I think data sharing of what we have uh, will be important. Um, much smarter as I'm not in that. And uh, you know, also what we've done with the Abraxane, actually we've been taking an agent that we know is active in preclinical but actually that's the agent nobody wanted to touch because it's way too toxic. And uh, you, go, you go with carboplatin that the high doses would actually penetrate. We don't know how much, we've never examined it, but that's the paradigm. Uh, uh, looking at temozolomide also, uh, maybe a little more, but I'm not sure that the increment is gonna make the difference. Paclitaxel will not cross that we know. The monoclonal antis, antibodies do not cross. Um, I think that's, uh, that's one way forward. And I think a lot will depend that we see in one of those trials, some kind of proof of concept. 
Oh, that's great. And, you know, I think your point about keeping some variables fixed uh, is important. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, as I mentioned, there, there seems to be so many moving parts that, that that's something that uh, is critical to do. Alex, uh, maybe you want to weigh in as well on this uh, question. Yes, um, thank you. So I, I, I was actually going to have asked Graham to mention his work um, in low-grade glioma patients, taking them to the operating room, which I think is uh, proof of principle, certainly, that we're getting effective blood-brain barrier opening. And to me, the the highest priority is to design a clinical trial that has that is sufficiently powered and and arranged in such a way that we would expect to see a clinical effect. So, since as was stated earlier today, the only regimen that has been shown to extend our patient survival is the stoop regimen, then it seems to me that we need to think about building on that. Um, and the challenge there, of course, is that it's a five-day regimen. And so the coordination of focused ultrasound with a five-day treatment every month is a logistical challenge and maybe merits some engineering to really think about decoupling this from MRI, for example, which is very resource intensive um, and also uh, potentially building uh, targeting and feedback tools, which can be implemented in a outpatient clinic setting. Um, obviously the Carthera device can be implemented in an outpatient setting, is implemented in an outpatient setting and might be one opportunity to marry that to the, to the upfront treatment with the stoop regimen. But Alex, if I can just be, uh, take the, the counter argument, to integrate that on the existing regimen, basically giving temozolomide is not gonna make it better. If I think more temozolomide is proven on different levels, that's not gonna make a big difference. You know, there may be a difference, but to really protect that. So I think you need a major difference. Now, uh, Manit mentioned you could take unmethylated ones and take a new agent in the upfront setting. That, yeah, but I wouldn't push back in using more of the same because either a bullet hits or it misses the target, but more of the same, it's not that there was a uh, question. Um, and we've looked into that uh, with trials we've done with temozolomide, with trials we've done 20 years ago with uh, high dose chemotherapy with alkylating agents uh, and bone marrow transplant. So we need both, we need agents that work whether it's targeted agents, cytotoxic agents, um, and that get there. The trouble is for all what we have done the last decade, one trial after the other, we don't know whether we failed, whether the agent was wrong or the target was wrong, or whether the drugs just never made it to where they should be. I have a question for the other uh, panelists, if I may. Yes, please. I mean, I'm just very curious as we speak about this and it's so early in the game and, and uh, this is a, a really accomplished group of panelists running clinical trials. What have been your efforts or what do you think needs to be done to have non-traditional clinical endpoints, but really biological endpoints to your trials? Graham uh, or Jin Wu, do you want to um, talk about non-traditional endpoints for clinical trials? Like more of yeah. a biological, right? Biological. Or, yeah. yeah, I think some, you know, some of the work by uh, Tracy Batchelor and colleagues at, uh, at Harvard, I think it speaks to this, which is we need to have ways, whether it's through tracer level doses or full doses of labeled agents to actually know whether they're getting in, how much they're getting in, where they're going. If we can visualize these therapeutics with high resolution imaging, or, and or by other biomarker based approaches, then we'll have a lot more of an understanding. I do like the window of opportunity approach and, and testing the delivery in tissues after, or um, you know, after delivery and then from surgical resection specimens, because you also have internal controls from other regions that may have not been treated. 
So that's another opportunity, but it is obviously a little bit more complicated and difficult to do that. So I, I think we need to have more understanding through both biomarker studies as well as through advanced imaging studies to, to follow this. And like I said, we can look at uh, Tracy Bachelor's work with temozolomide as an example of that. Yeah. So related to that, there is a question from the audience about uh, the role, if any, of FDG PETs in phase one trials or, or more advanced trials in FUS, FUS and GBM. What is the panel's opinion, uh, uh, Jinwoo or, 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 or Manmi, uh, sort of what, what are your thoughts on functional metabolic imaging as potential outcomes uh, for this? Jinwoo, I know you've done work also in Alzheimer's disease uh, with, with focus ultrasound, uh, but what are, you, what are your thoughts on, on, on metabolic imaging? Yeah, I think it's very important questions, but in, the, in our the clinical trial for Alzheimer's disease, we are undergoing the FDG and the amyloid PET. Uh, and also the, the, uh, we are also trying to uh, apply the tau pad for the imaging media studies. But the, for the glioblastoma, it's somewhat different. The, the, uh, I think the most important thing is the, uh, the uh, tumor, the, the amount of the tumor volumes and also the um, area of the, the tumor invasion. Uh, as the, uh, the uh, the Adams ask and they, uh, we don't know which type of the treatment is the best at this moment, even with the BB opening trial. You just want to confirm the safety issues of the BB opening. And uh, in our first, in my first clinical trial, I confirmed in the safety in the, of the multiple BB opening of the very small area of the, uh, the adjacent area of the tumor resection with the uh, insectic device. Uh, just, we just followed in the stop protocol. As, as you know, the, uh, most of the patient had you know, the six times of the BB opening during the sixth cycle of the temozolomide therapy according to the stop protocol. We didn't see any complication, but uh, we found that such approach won't be applicable for the majority of the tumors, especially for the recurrent tumors. The area of the BB opening should be very wide to cover the, you know, this, the area of the signal changes and et cetera. And um, I think uh, because of that, we are now the one of test you know, the, uh, the safety issues of the wide BB opening with the new uh, the systems. But um, still, there are many problems depends on the regulatory issues of the different countries. For example, Korean government you know, that uh, does not approve to use you know, the a uh, large amount of the micro bubble to open the BBB. Uh, so we have some limitation of the opening the BBB even with the new softwares. But uh, inside they almost developed the new transducers to cover the whole area at once. And uh, if we can reduce the time of the BBB opening, uh, if, if we can do uh, BB opening at the same time in the wide areas, we don't need to worry about the you know, amount of the micro bubble. And uh, as uh, Neil mentioned, you know, the, the functional imaging is also very important for to see the progression of the tumors or the, um, to see the, any um, beneficial effect of the, uh, these procedures. But uh, eventually the most important of the imaging is the MRI. I believe. Thank you. And um, I would just like to welcome uh, Professor Isabel Germano from Mount Sinai Hospital and neurosurgeon to ask a question of the panel. I believe you're, you may be muted. We can't, we can't hear you. Uh, I think you're muted. My question to you all is, um, unfortunately, uh, we had so many failed trials for GBM, and yet each trial that we do, we continue to have the control arm. So is it possible to, as we move on, to kind of endorse a concept maybe similar to what the Agile trial uh, has now, where we don't necessarily need that control trial for, if, control arm for each trial that we do? Thank you for that. Maybe Manmeet can start and then we'll get Roger's opinion. Yeah, so uh, nice to see you, Isabel. A great question. And I agree. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the FDA is taking note. Uh, this is increasingly becoming a hot topic, uh, you know, not only for investigators, but for patients. 
patients participate in trials, especially in glioblastoma trials to get the innovative technology in, or the uh, intervention, right? Uh, we know our standard of care is not gold standard. We need to do much better for our patients. So clearly I think there is um, uh, these cadre of trials like uh, the INSIGHT uh, trial uh, that is run out of uh, the group at, uh, in Boston, the Harvard system with Patrick as the lead where you know there are multiple arms or the GBM Agile approach, the Bayesian designs, where you can go up and down and minimize the you know, ineffective arms or maximize the effective arms. There is a discussion with the FDA. There's a company which uh, you know, looking at a genetically engineered virus, and we are trying to look at to minimize the control arm there. Uh, the question really is now is how can you use the real world evidence to uh, you know, mitigate some of the requirements for the control arm? So there are some designs where actually, if you can show that uh, the control arm is behaving with the real world evidence, you can at, at least uh, substitute some amount of patient participation in the control arm uh, in, in, in lieu of the real world evidence that is being uh, accumulated and certainly being looked at in other tumor types. And I think we can definitely do more of that in glabrous tumor. Thank you. Uh, Roger, what do you think? Novel trial designs. So uh, novel trial designs, yes, but Isabel, I would caution and meet with this real world uh, synthetic data set because the patients on trial are uh, very select. The patients who come and see us for trials are the ones who can travel. So we automatically get uh, a bias. Now, there are different ways nevertheless to, uh, to link. Yes, multi-arm trials in the beginning. If we can get also industry to collaborate, if you have a common control arm, um, that's one way. Another attractive way as a screening approach would be just a randomized phase two um, with several experimental arms and no true control. Um, how good is the charm? Uh, you know, if all the arms are the same, very unlikely that after 30 years not bringing much forward that all of a sudden we have three home runs and they all, all work. So uh, if I don't see it. Now, of course, it's also a, a question of the magnitude of the difference. If the experimental arm, even on the select population, gives us a hazard ratio of 0.3 compared to historical control, it's just, a, or a clear plateau, uh, that's different. But even certain publications that got into the New England Journal, presumably on a plateau, uh, we don't get far from convinced that this is true. And at the end of the day, to go along with what Manmeet said, yeah, for the patients, that's absolutely correct. But if it, the quickest way to get something at the end to the patients are at the end somewhat to randomize a conclusive trial. We're doing way too many of the same trials, single center, few centers, non-controlled, which is also kind of a waste of effort that I'm not sure uh, brings us forward. Um, and for the younger ones on the audience, you know, if you go back on the temozolomide story, um, that's the reason I'm sitting here. And my credit is not that temozolomide worked. The credit I get is to took it, that I took it up front against everybody else and that we were running a randomized trial when uh, the signal was actually not that strong. And at the time, to be very uh, transparent, I was actually arguing we do first a phase two trial that is encouraging enough, but if I, this, but it would not have been encouraging enough as a single arm, but with a randomized control um, large enough, it was adopted at this uh, instantly. So I think it's, uh, there is pros and cons uh, how to design, but I think multiple control arms working together rather than running all the single center trials uh, would be a first good step forward and everybody gets something new. Can I add a, a clarification point to Roger? And I agree with the, you know, the uh, very eloquent uh, points that Roger has uh, uh, definitely shared. So when we use real world evidence, we actually maximize that to uh, the, the control arm of the study. That would be taking into account the age the confounding factors, right? Which are the uh, drivers of outcomes, right? So you would look at age, you'd look at sex, you would look at performance status, you'd look at number of therapies. So the intent is to uh, make it as equitable as possible. 
And the intent uh, of the discussions with the FDA is the real world evidence will only be used if the control arm is following the real world evidence, which may or may not be true. And I agree with you. Uh, that has been a big challenge in a number of failed trials that we've seen in not only glioblastoma, but in others where uh, the, 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 uh, the entity which is designing the trial has failed to really accommodate for the outcomes in a particular patient population. And rendipotent trial was a very good example of the EGFR V3 variant where the control group did much better uh, than you know, the average outcomes at Bablastoma. And I also agree these, uh, and I've been guilty of that early in my career, these single arm, small phase two trials actually do not most of the time lead us anywhere because of the confidence intervals being so large and the companies or uh, the developing entities or cooperative groups sometimes don't have the confidence to advance that further. So one, one advice I'll have for the young investigators because I've been through that uh, aspect, if you're designing these smallish trials, if we use the term 20, 30 patients, a lot of times, uh, you know, I would say what Graham had said earlier and Dr. Galbi had said as well, try to identify a biomarker, do a window of opportunity trial, try to enrich the outcome where if you're gonna get a small signal, you might know what to take that to the next level. Because a lot of times we'll, stuck, we'll be stuck with two or three patients doing well on our 20 or 30 patient trial. And we just don't know how to use that information to take it to the next level. Very sage advice, I think, um, I and mean, really appreciate it. Uh, we just have uh, three or four minutes left uh, on the panel. Uh, and I guess one of the benefits of these Zoom-based uh, workshops is that they're more often on time uh, because we, we will be cut off. <laughs> so uh, maybe, uh, Adam, I can ask you a quick question that came in from the Q&A, which has to do with uh, preclinical models and, and whether they have informed whether the, the opening of the blood tumor barrier closes at the same rate as the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and more broadly, how have preclinical models informed your, your work currently? And what threshold do those need to show in order to go to phase one trials? That's a great question. I will, I will start by saying I'm a little skeptical of the blood tumor barrier being something you can well model on, on the mouse. Uh, I, I think the most clinically relevant and... Uh, helpful model is a mouse that has no brain tumor. Uh, because then what you're really modeling is the peritumoral brain that is the source of 80 to 90% of the recurrences. And I think if you do not really necessarily look at mechanism of action, but rather at, you know, biodistribution, pharmacokinetic parameters, safety, you know, you pretty much can, can argue that if something is going across and the mouse that has no brain tumor, the, the brain hasn't been perforated by a needle, nothing and you're getting substantial increase in drug, drug levels and, and that the, the, this is safe, I think that's very compelling. So I, I personally have taken the approach of minimizing the use of brain tumor models to, to study these particular aspects and just use them to see if the, the pharmacokinetics are right. Very good. Um... So um, just to let everybody know, we will be wrapping up in a few minutes and there will be a technical break between the two panel sessions. So please stay tuned for the subsequent uh, uh, session that's coming up right after this one, after this one concludes. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, at this point, ask the panel if there are any concluding thoughts you might have uh, given your experience so far uh, about these early phase clinical trials. Great. So, so with that, I'd just like to thank everybody for, for joining us. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's been a terrific discussion, terrific questions from the audience, and really a privilege to, to, to moderate this outstanding panel and given all the expertise that is uh, on the session today. So with that, I invite everybody uh, in the audience to stay tuned for the subsequent uh, panels coming up later. Uh, and again, there'll be a quick technical break. Uh, and then everything will resume uh, a few minutes later. Thank you again to the panelists and everybody out there.